What's going on, everybody? It's episode number 199 of the Audible Farm Podcast, and this episode is brought to you by Couchtown Coffee. Couchtown Coffee is roasted right here in Iowa. It's my favorite coffee. I drink it every morning. I say this every week. It's all the truth. It's my favorite coffee. It really honestly is. I need to order some more, and I need to do it soon, because I'm running out, and then if you guys listen to this weekly, you know that every now and then I run out and it's just like I had to drink some other stuff and it wasn't very good. I'm going to try and avoid that. I'm going to make an order. I'm going to do it real quick. Uh, I could probably do it right now, as a matter of fact. Just go to CouchtownCoffee.com, find a coffee you like, let them know how you want it roasted, and they'll ship it to your house. When you make an order, let them know Audible Farm sent you. Uh, just say, hey, uh, I like these coffees. I want these uh, Audible Farm. That's how I found out about this. Boom. You get 20% off. Why? Couchtown Coffee. That's why. Couchtown Coffee is that awesome. So hit them up. Try out some of the best coffee you've ever had roasted right here in Iowa. Thanks, Couchtown. This week, I'm sitting down with Patrick Tecklenburg. Uh, I've I've kind of known Patrick for a while, but I guess I kind of haven't. So uh, Patrick is actually somebody that grew up in the same town I grew up in, and he's younger than me. And I kind of knew his siblings, who were older, but I found out that he played music through a friend that we had that was mutual. And it's like, this is really cool. And he's basically, he said, Patrick, you know, Patrick's been listening to this podcast. You, sh- you should uh, get in touch with him and just say hi. And I, I do, you know, and I, I see he's out there playing music and he's doing stuff. And then one day he uh, shows up at the jam night that I go to up in north central Iowa and uh, you know, he's not necess- He's from here, from this area originally, but he doesn't live up here. So it's kind of like, what are you doing up here or whatever? And I got to see him play, and then he booked a show. And I mean, it's just up one end and down the other. It was, it was quite a fun time. So, I, I mean, it's just really fun to kind of have gotten to know him over the course of the last handful of months. I even got the opportunity to play a little bit with him at a show, which was really cool as well. So uh, this podcast is really fun. Uh, I sit down and just kind of get to know him a little bit, you know, and and this one's really crazy because I feel like we cover a lot of ground, but I also feel like I left a lot not quite talked about. So we're going to figure that out uh, maybe on a follow-up podcast sometimes. So uh, I hope you guys enjoy this one as much as I did. I sit down and get to know Patrick Tecklenburg, who's actually from where I'm from, but I just didn't know him growing up. So this is really fun. So kick back, relax, and enjoy this episode with, uh, I almost want to say long time listener, first time caller, but it's not quite that deal because this isn't on the radio. So I hope you guys enjoy this one. It's episode 199 with Patrick Tecklenburg. It's the Audible Farm Podcast. Your host, Peter Stockdale. I'm sitting down today with Patrick Tecklenburg. Patrick, you are a guitarist. You are also a drummer. Did I see you playing drums the other day? Uh, uh, I, I would say I'm a singer. And I accompany myself with guitar, and sometimes when people let me, I play drums. There you go, there you go. So you've actually listened to the podcast a bunch. Uh, well, everything I do, I do, uh, I make it a habit. Podcasts are very habit-forming things as well. So, uh, what was that, two years ago? About? I I had heard of the podcast, I knew it existed, I knew that you were making it. I, I vaguely, uh, yeah, vaguely remembered you. I, I don't, I don't know that our paths has ever crossed, really. No. Nope. Well, I mean, like, like I, I had seen you around, but I don't know that I had ever talked to you ever. And you probably had seen me, but had no idea who I was because I was younger. Does that, that make sense? That, that makes a lot of sense. Right. When right. you're younger, there's a lot of older people you remember. And yeah, older, yeah, they're like people. cool, and you look up to them because oh you're like gosh. in that. Oh no. Age range. I'm not saying I was looking up to you good. necessarily, okay, but like you Woo, you were a, sigh of but you went to school with my brother and my sister, so. Yes. All right, what was the question? I uh, I honestly don't remember how we got to where we're at. Okay. Um, but you've listened to the podcast. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, no, I knew that the podcast existed. Um and then um and then my uh my coworker Ben Wicket had the sticker on his water bottle. Oh yeah. And um then I asked him about it. And because I was just like, somebody listens to a podcast from Humble. Well, that's why. But I mean, like he's from Humble, whatever. But um, I don't know. That kind of like made me think about it. Then one day I was just like, well, it, it was just it was just like on my list of like someday I'm going to listen to that. 
And then uh, one day I did, and then I was just... Was there a specific episode that brought you in, or uh, was there just like one it day? It was like, oh. uh, a woman from a band called The Screaming Artichokes, which oh. I think is like a Humboldt band or something. Yeah. That was like, it was like December, I think. Yeah, it was Stephanie Miller. Okay. Yeah, yeah Miller. and uh, there's just like a lot of names being dropped of like people from my past. Oh, yeah. And I was just like, this is wild. I was li- like, I was cooking like some spaghetti or something, and like my <laughs> roommate was like walking around and... He he was always I don't know he always thought I was like a really good cook so he would like watch me when I cooked stuff, um, and um, and I was just like cracking up like this is wild like you know I listen to all these famous people and I it's like I know that there's like um, smaller scale you know podcasts out there, um, but uh, I don't know it was just like it was just funny you know because when you grow up in a small remote town in uh, in the Midwest. Um, it's, you, you form these kind of connections to people that they, (laughs) I, you know, it's like, it's like the fact that like when you walk down the street, you wave at everybody you see, whereas in a big city, you ignore them because their people are so plentiful. It's like, it would be weird to say hi. So what I'm getting at is like, you, I think, you know, more about people in a small town the people around you, right? Am I, am I making this up? Yeah. I mean, there definitely is that, but like the whole reason I kind of created the podcast was so like everyone would get to know all of us, you know, Yeah, it's kind of one of those deals where like, even if you've seen, you know, whoever Jeremy over play a thousand shows, you might not have ever got a chance to sit down and talk with them. And guess what? I, I bothered him until he sat down and talked with me, you know? So like just stuff like that, where you just hit people up like, Hey, you know, unload, you know? So, right. Right. And that's why you're here. Yeah, no, but to go back to the characters thing, like, after listening for two years, I might have mentioned this to you, though, but, like, previously, but um, when I first jammed with you guys in Barnum, uh, it's just, like, one person after the other, like, from this whole, like, world that I've been listening to, oh, you know, for nuts. the couple of years, and it's like, oh, there's that, and it's like, they don't know anything about me, they don't know who I am, but, like, I feel like I know their whole life story, and it's hilarious, like... I don't, you know, it's an interesting psychological uh, experiment. So that's crazy. Yeah, I yeah. never thought of that because it's. I mean, if you just take Clint Riedel alone, he's been on like six or seven right eight podcasts. Right. He's he's on here a lot. So like a lot of people probably know him pretty well. Yeah, he's probably the biggest character of them all too. <laughs> yeah, I know. So like you walk in, and you're just like, I've heard this guy talk a bunch. You know, I've heard this guy talk a yeah. bunch. You know. Which is crazy because, like, honestly, the first time me and Clint did a podcast was the first time I ever met him. Oh, okay. It was like, I showed up at his house and Brad was like, hey, uh, this is Clint. And Clint, this is Peter. And then Brad was like, I'm going to go. And just, like, took off. And it was like, what? <laughs> like, Did you know Brad previously? Uh, through Facebook Messenger. Okay. So, yeah. Right. It was pretty wild. <laughs> Interesting. But, yeah, it's pretty crazy. I never thought about that with, like, you know, you go to you go to these events and it's just like, yeah, I know that person. I know that person. They've been on the podcast and they've been on the podcast. And I mean, to be not saying you listen to every single week, every single time, maybe you do, but it's still, it's, it's like, you still have like the opportunity to be like, Oh, this person looks familiar. I saw the post, you know, that person I've seen them before or whatever. And yeah. And, uh, you know, to go back to that whole like podcast world idea, I, um, a few years ago realized that like, you know, I've got like my three main podcasts that I listen to every week. And at some point I realized that like, like every person of those three had been mentioned on every other one. And so it's like, you know, it's, it's like this world. Yeah. And like Stevie wonder said, like music is a world within itself or whatever, which is kind of unrelated, but, uh, Anyhow, that's what we're here today to talk about. That's before I left, my parents wanted like, what are you guys going to talk about? And I was like, music. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, that's pretty much all this is, you know? Yeah. So we, that's basically how I, I found out who you were. Like, honestly, Ben, uh, your coworker, one of my friends was like, Hey, you should sit down and talk with Patrick Tecklenburg. And I was like, Oh, the name's familiar. You know, like, well, no, he, um, we were having a bonfire in my backyard. He's not my coworker anymore. He was, but, yeah. um, we were, we were like burning some crap in my backyard and cuz he had mentioned that you were a friend of his when i poked pointed at his at the sticker that one day and it, that was kind of i don't know whatever but um he was like uh 
I was like, yeah, I want to jam with him. And, uh, and he's like, okay, I'll, I'll hit him up right now. I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> you know, like, uh, <laughs> and, but then I guess he did. And I think you were, and I think you hit him right back. We were just like, uh, who's that? <laughs> you know, but, uh, I don't know. I guess it happened, you know? It yeah. Happened. It actually did eventually happen. You and I got to jam together we a jam. little bit. It was fun. Yeah. It's pretty awesome. So let's start all the way back at the beginning. You know, let's start at the very beginning. Oh, it's a very good place yeah. to start. I was born. You were born. Pearl okay. Harbor Day, 1991, the 50th anniversary. Really? Yeah. Well, that's crazy. Um, yeah. And well, last year was the 80th anniversary, which makes me 30 years old. Oh, dang. All right. So you're an old man, de- deceptively young looking. Yeah, I have a bunion on my foot, which is why I'm wearing sandals. <laughs> I've discovered that once you hit 30... It all goes to hell, man. It, it, I'm sorry. Everything, just, everything breaks. It does. Oh, everything, my gosh. all the time. It's just like I'm just... Every day I'm waking up and I'm taking stock of what is the state of all my injuries. So, <laughs> And I should, you know... It's on my to-do list to take a little bit better care of myself, but um, it's a work in progress. Like yeah, everything definitely. Else, yeah, know? I mean, let's, it, it's just always going to be something on your mind for the rest of your life, I think, because I, I don't know. It's not like I'm a million years older, but I'm 35, and it's like, yeah, I thought about all that stuff. That's definitely something that's been on my mind for a while, but oh, there's so much cat hair. For everybody watching on Patreon, I've been petting a cat yeah, off screen. You were kind enough to give me a Mountain Dew, but I don't know about the uh, antihistamines. You got any of those? I, it, I, it's not bugging me now. And honestly, they, you know, that's got the same hair, it looks like, as my little sister's cat, which doesn't bother me. Like, I can sleep on her couch. and uh, But yeah, I do have allergies. You're listening to Cat Talk on the Audible Farm right. Podcast. Uh, let's go to music talk. How, how old were you when you first had like an interest in music? I mean, did you take piano lessons growing up? Did you go, were you like a, I was a trombone player all through high school. I was a trombone player. I just assumed, I like to try to guess. Yeah. You seemed like a trombone player. It's this, yeah, I, I think like they give you the little audition and then, um, ultimately you're just going to do what you're going to do. And I don't, I don't know. I don't know why I picked it over the trumpet. I, th- I don't know. It was Somebody the slide. Might've... It's the slide, man. It looks so cool. Well, like everybody, like it's like the cool thing. They try to like steer you away from the saxophone, I feel like maybe because yeah. everybody wants to do that and then they all want to do the trumpet and then for some reason, they have like some way to manipulate you out of doing that and then, um, and uh, they, they got me, I think. I don't know. <laughs> they don't, don't got me. I don't know. Maybe I was just trying to be different because my, all my friends were playing the trumpet. That's probably what it was. I don't know. But I, I started listening to music a lot when I was, uh, well, I mean, just, you know, from when I was a, a wee lad, mm-hmm. um, my cousins and I were at, uh, we were tailgating before, uh, the zombies show at Codfish Hollow a few weeks ago. And I had my, uh, my playlist was going and Savage Garden came on, <laughs> like, mm-hmm. uh, what's the song called? Truly Madly Deeply. And then uh, they, they yeah. just all started cracking up and I'm like, this was my first band. Like, cause my siblings listened to it. We were all like little, I don't know how they got into it, but it was like pop music, you know, like kitty yeah. pop kind of. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Um, and then, and then there's like the Disney channel stuff, which every once in a while when I'm with my siblings, I'll throw that on the playlist. And, um, so, but God, who's calling me? Um, it's probably the Cedar Rapids Public Library. I owe them a few favors. Um, <laughs> so I uh, so I listened to a lot of music and I really studied it too. But and like just that silly pop stuff, kind of. That's where it started. And uh, but I remember like like listening to it over and over and over again, like jumping on the trampoline and uh, playing Legos. And my brother brought home like all the Now CDs, and so that kind of gave me like a wider exposure. And there's stuff that you know. Yeah, you know, that introduced me to like Radiohead, Sublime, New Radicals, you know, like cool stuff like that from the nineties and um that, you know, as an adult I'm still like, This is this is good stuff, you know. And I still put it on in a non ironic way, really. Um, but uh okay, so I listened to a lot of music and I really studied it and um, you know, I I get pretty obsessed with stuff and like, you know, 
um, collect a lot of information in my mind about it. Um, but there was like, um, a period of my life where like baseball really took over and, uh, and sports. Um, and you know, I'd go home from school and watch two hours of ESPN as many, you know, sports center and as many baseball tonight, as many baseball games as I could. And I would, uh, you know, if I was sick from school, I would just, I would watch ESPN all day. And, um, and then it, it just kind of flipped to music. So like fifth grade, you know, I started playing the trombone and I know I was never offered piano lessons or encouraged probably because my dad always says, yeah, when I was a kid, my mom made me take piano lessons. I hated it. Oh, <laughs> and so, yeah. uh, it, and, and so it makes me wonder like, and now I have nieces and I'm like, and they, I, I know if, if we had the right equipment around, which it's kind of on like my to-do list to put that equipment in front of them. But like the, they're smart kids and they'll soak it up like a sponge. And it's like, Hey, do you want to learn how to play twinkle, twinkle, little star on oh, this yeah, piano? Yeah, you know, sweet. like, yep. and just like get them and not like being too pushy, but you know, it's, I read this whole thing about how like all the best tennis players in the world, like if you're, you'll never be one of the greatest if you don't like have that insane parent, because all the greatest ones did. And I'm not saying that music is the same way, but it makes you wonder if, but I don't know. It's just like, I wish that I played piano when I was five years old because I'm terrible at piano now. And it's, it's frustrating because if I wanted to get as, as fluent as it, as I am on guitar, then I would have to really, really sit down for a lot of hours and like yeah think about all the time you had to put into playing the guitar to get as good yeah, as you are but and, and like i've made some leaps and bounds just from <sighs> making small commitments to it but at the end of the day it's just like that's that's somebody else's specialty it's not mine yeah but um anyhow so so yeah, I started playing the trombone when I was in fifth grade, and then uh, around uh, seventh grade is when uh, I got really just like obsessed with music, um, and uh, the it's just kind of it was like a gradual thing, and then like it it really like flipped, and then uh, you know by high school I I wasn't watching sports anymore, and it and it's just uh, you know I, I had other hobbies, you know play, play video games and stuff, but like. Uh, music has always just been that thing that, uh, I don't know. It's like, uh, the, the deeper you get down the rabbit hole, the harder it is to get out. (laughs) And, uh, uh, the more fun and exciting it seems to be and the more adventures you seem to go on. And I just never have lost the love for it. And, um, yeah. So do you have a that that I guess that's where it started, and that 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 answers your question, right? Yeah, in a long sense, it's great. I love it because now I don't have to do as much talking if you give me the good answers like that. So here's a good thing: you kind of were influenced by your siblings with music, like their musical choices and and what they had around. So it's kind of beneficial for people who are, had older siblings to do that for them. You know, um, this is this is just the way it is. Like I I did not necessarily care too much for like r&b and rap but that's a lot of what like my sister listened to in high school so i i didn't really take after what she was listening to you know uh almost at all but it's still one of those things where and how much older is she just a couple years okay so but you were talking about how you like some of the first stuff that interested you was like that kind of bubblegum poppy kind of not necessarily like Britney Spears type stuff. But oh that, yeah, but, oh we yeah but, we listen to Britney Spears. But that kind of stuff. I I remember you know I, I have a lot of memories, but like I remember on my brother's birthday it was probably like 1999, and we went to the mall in Fort Dodge and got the Baby One More Time CD. Nice. Or he did, and then I listened to it with him and with my other siblings. You know, there's five of us crammed into it. You know, not a huge house and like spent a lot of time together, yeah. you know, but yeah. it heads a little bit, but, uh, the music was always there and, and it, it's, you know, you, so were you saying that you kind of came around to the R and B and rap and stuff later? No, but I, I would definitely say I fell into the first kind of music. Like this is going to lead me to like what my question to you would be, would like the first music that I actually went out and like sought after myself 
was music that was in and i always use this as a joke it's like this is it was like montage music for like the season finale of friends the upcoming season you know like it's just like that kind of music where it's just you know i wish that you would step back from that that's my friend it's just like a whole bunch of that like will will chandler and monica you know it's like that kind of stuff going on so um but the first cd i remember i ever bought um that was like music from a band was uh bu- 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 nine days the madden crowd so that would have been like uh story of a girl yeah. was like the big song from that Cried album. river and drown the whole world. yeah so okay. if you're interested in anything if you're still like man that song was pretty good go listen to the whole album the whole album's actually just like stacked with songs exactly that good it's just it's like good ho- it's just like holy cow yeah the whole i still listen to it they're like, a one-hit wonder though right like people, was that was that the only so. one the only one that everybody knows right but i could sing you the whole album oh start I, to, I, like, I bet you could that's the thing like when you're when you're that young and you soak it up and like you like even you know there's stuff that like i fell in love with like five years ago that's more modern and but it still doesn't like hit you at like that central nervous system like lizard brain area when you hear it the way like that stuff that i did when i was a kid you know where it's just like whoa like you just flooded with these emotions you know yeah and it takes you back to that moment like it's you just can't recreate that as an adult because your brain is just uh it's fully wired you know and yeah yeah I mean, that's, that is another honestly like weird thing. Cause the first, like the, what was some of the first music that you yourself got into? We'll start there. Like what was uh, like, by choice and yeah, like, like what, by... was, what was like one of the first CDs you ever bought? So like, I'm going to go spend my money on this one. Yeah. I think yeah. This one sounds good. Yeah. So, um, what I will say is that, um, like, so around like middle school time is I, I would say I was, uh, listening to, my well i I always listen to my brother's stuff and we shared our bedroom for a long time but um there's some stuff that i didn't go out and buy because my brother had it but i listened to it a lot and that would have been like fleetwood mac and um stuff like yeah um but um so then i kind of started getting into my dad's stuff and like my dad growing up was only he has this awesome stereo and it's it's way too big for the house, but like, you know, (laughs) he would always be, be rocking out like on Saturday mornings and I'd be angry. And and so like, I kind of got this distaste kind of for a lot of that stuff. But, you know, as I was approaching adult or not approach, but like, you know, 18, like the end of high school is when I, um, you know, learned to love like Bob Dylan and, um, stuff like that. Um, and really dug into like Elton John and the Beatles. The Beatles were my mom's band though. He, my dad's more lukewarm to them. But so to answer your question, um, uh, my dad had the Joshua tree by U2 and I, um, listened to that one because, um, well, because U2 is still really popular back in 2004, 2005. Um, they're still very popular today, obviously, but, um, they, you know, and, and I, I, as a kid, I'd liked you too as well. Um, you know, a few other songs, but so I was like, I know you too. And so I listened to Joshua tree and really fell in love with that. And so the first CD I bought was U two best of 1980 to 1990. And so I, I really got into you two and then, um, and queen, I don't know why, what really struck me. I mean, everybody loves queen, but, um, so I listened to YouTube Queen, the Goo Goo Dolls. I, I listened oh. to them when I was a little kid too. Um, but Love then, them. um, yeah, yeah, I'm going to see them. I've never seen them, but they're coming to Cedar Rapids, uh, in September and me and my coworkers are going to go and it's like on a weeknight. So I, I hope that not too many people call in the next day, but, um, anyhow, uh, so that it was like, yeah, those three, I was, I was really into those bands, uh, you know, middle school, seventh grade, um, in addition, the Fleetwood Mac was always the big granddaddy and, but then, um, it just kind of progressed. I, I, I'm not going to give you the whole history of my musical taste, but I would say like, as I, you know, went through like middle school into high school, it just became like nineties music in general. Cause it had that nostalgic thing to it from when I was just a puny little kid and some of those songs I knew. And, and so I'd listen to like Everclear, Collective Soul and stuff. But, that, but then that kind of like led me to like Pearl Jam and I got really into all the grunge bands. And so um, I, I love that stuff a lot. Um, and then towards the end of high school, um, like I said, like, you know, the Beatles, Elton John, Bob Dylan, more my parents' stuff, but also like I just started hitting the Rolling Stones really hard. 
Um, and they're, you know, like most people who love, who love the Rolling Stones, it's probably like the most listened to band that you have because they've been around for forever. They have the most music and they're just that good. Um, so Rolling Stones, um, towards the end of high school, I feel like Red Hot Chili Peppers were really big for me too. Um, and you know, there's all sorts of other random crap, but I feel like those are the ones that come to mind. So that's where it progressed. And then into college is when I started getting more into the alternative country and, uh, you know, all sorts of stuff. But I'd say with, uh, as far as musical taste goes, um, it's for me and it's, you know, I have so many people, it seems like who are just like, you know, like Rick Rubin was saying this on his podcast recently. And, uh, and my cousin always says it too, like, I'm not a lyrics guy. I'm not a lyrics guy. I'm all about Sonics, but like, I'm a lyrics guy. And I, you know, like I, I enjoy poetry, I guess. And I appreciate poetry, but, um, but like lyrics and music is, is different and separate, but like it, it has to have like the Sonics attached to it. Like, you know, it has to be sung or spoken over music, but you know, I, but like, and I do listen to instrumental stuff too, but like I get really into lyrics and I, uh, I think the English language is just something that, uh, I don't know. I've developed an appreciation after speaking it since I was a wee <laughs> lad. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe it was Bob Dylan that, uh, I don't know, really ignited. Or the Beatles. I mean, the Beatles, the Stones, they've all got such good lyrics. Bernie Toppin wrote all those Elton John lyrics. And I guess I should say that uh, did the video crap out. Uh-oh. It sure did. All right. Uh, Tom Waits is my favorite artist. And he, uh, I think, has better lyrics than Bob Dylan. I love Leonard Cohen, too. Um, and I love Bob Dylan, too. But Tom Waits is... And if you want to talk about Sonics, I mean, he's a musicologist. Like, he does... He like scratches every weird little itch and turns it upside down on top of its head within all his different records that he's made. And, um, you know, he's all these collaborations with Keith Richards and Les Claypool and just so many treasures. And I would say like his five best records, there's so many just dynamite songs on them that. I don't know. It's just like when you talk about like, who's the greatest artist of all time, and I'm not making the argument that he is necessarily, but like, I think you just got to look at the, the quantity of like the stellar output and during what I would say were his golden years of like the nineties and stuff and the eighties, like, Oh, he made so, so much good stuff. All right. It is kind of <laughs> weird what we gravitate to though. Like, um, like I said, I kind of was into like the more poppy stuff. So the first music I started listening to that involved like playing instruments and and you know like a band image was like a lot of pop punk stuff. That right. was really popular at yeah. the time when oh, I was yeah. growing up. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Your yeah. Blink One Eighty Twos, your Green Day Seventy Fives. Uh, that's a Sum Forty One joke. Green Day Seventy. It's really it's a deep deep Sum Forty One okay. joke. All right. If anybody gets that one, call in. Call oh, in. Oh, I bet there's tons because people our age that's their like. I don't know, maybe like the Gen X, it's like they, they like the, like the, the eighties, like hair metal stuff. And mm-hmm. that, that's like the, the standard thing that people that generation, you kind of assume they listen to and cause most of them do. And, and I don't really like that hair metal or, See, or the, maybe you do, but, uh, but in, in, you know, like what, like, you know, still me being not that much younger than you, uh, when I was in high school, like the pop punk emo stuff i don't really know where you draw the line on that but that was king you know i would say and um and now that we are this age it's like those bands are coming around in sort of a nostalgic way and like (laughs) playing at these venues that they weren't playing at back in those days but and you know people like us are going to see and you know I, i see a lot of like you know, on like Facebook, uh, music groups and stuff. And people, it's, it's, there seems like there's a fair amount of like, Hey, I want to start a pop punk band. And, and there's like, there's, you know, like pop punk tribute bands and stuff around the state I know. And, mm-hmm. um, and there's a lot of that. And I just never, uh, it's, it's like, I know, I, you know, I know the fallout boy songs that were on the radio and yep. stuff, but I never, I never dug into it because the panic at the disco. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah all, all that Thorn stuff. Heights all that and, stuff. Like I mean, yeah. how do we need to go through a name of these <laughs> old bands? But. They all had really long song titles oh, and, yeah. uh, so, strange. So there's a band yeah. that's, uh, from the quad cities area that's called Eugene Levy and, yeah, they, and they've yeah. like basically 
made a pop punk band that is like a recreation like of what they all were so all their songs are like super long song titles just like you said they have like almost nothing to do with what's going on in the song uh-huh. so like they had a song that um got a lot of play that was some it was called something like i'm like mankind in the way that i don't say i quit <laughs> yeah it's song titles like the like the this the weird like long phrase mm-hmm. um but uh that that makes me I, there was some i was watching some guy's comedy special and it was kind of outlandish and he was like singing for a lot of it i can't remember his name this is a few years ago but he was like singing as like a pop punk singer and like it's like that that just that whiny like yeah it's nasally I don't, I don't know how else to describe it but like when you hear it you know it and it was like a it was a thing it was a trope yep. in the popular music of that day for kids who uh were pissed off at their parents so here's a sneaky trick for that one that i learned if you sing through your nose but you hold your finger against your nostrils it really like exemplifies that sound in your own voice you stick your finger in your nostril not in your nostrils but like across like you're making a fake mustache Mm. so you sing out of your nose and do that and it's just it's it's literally like all buzz it's it's pretty awesome so it's it's like you're making a nose kazoo go home and do my homework on that one give that one a whirl or or not there's gonna be a whole bunch of people like <laughs> yelling into their cars right now like i think it's working <laughs> right right we've given uh it's an interactive show today everybody <laughs> so that's i mean like i love that pop punk stuff and then I, I come to find out that a lot of the pop punk guys like grew up listening to a lot of metal stuff so i started getting into oh, yeah. metal and the deeper i got into the guitar the more appreciation i ended up finding i had for like playing music where i feel like there's a difference where some people go the singer songwriter route where they're like, I'm more interested in people writing songs on like on an acoustic with this thing than mm-hmm. I am with like five dudes with long hair and, and cut up right, jeans like, right. yelling into microphones or whatever. And I was I just gravitated towards that because that was kind of me. I was like, you know, long haired, angry uh-huh. person in high school, and then quit. What are you? A, get out of there, got cat! A cat emergency again. Cat. I'm just. Why'd you leave the door open? I don't know. It okay. was still in here when I left. Got it. Left, got it. It. It's an it. Hey. I suppose if you spayed or neutered it, that I just, takes some of its uh, yeah. We'll see. I doubt it. But. Gusto away. Get out of there. Yeah, there's a cat in the studio, ladies and gentlemen. There is a, a cat in here. Once you, I'm sure you can hear that on the microphone. It's great. Anyways, yeah, I, I gravitated more towards like metal music and things like that because as far as like musicianship, that's what I viewed as like exemplary. You know, all these guys can play so many notes so fast. Oh, yeah. They're well, they got to be the best. You know, or like whatever. Oh, I was, I was like that too, you know, like, uh, trying to figure out like who was the best guitar player of that decade or whatever, you know, as if it was like sports, you know? Yep. Oh, it's Steve Vai. It's gotta be Steve Vai. Yeah. And just like who, uh, who of this time frame is like analogous to who of that decade. And it's just like, I don't know. That's not really the way it works. No, it's subjective. It's unfortunate. Cause I mean, there's so many people that are out there that are like this guy, this guy's like Guthrie Govan, and Guthrie's like a million times better than Steve Vai, isn't it? It's like, is that who the guitar brand is named after? Go- uh, Govan? Uh, Govin? I don't know. I, think it's, I, think, I don't even know if that's how you pronounce his last name. It's oh, probably okay. Govan. I've, or I've never heard of that guy, but he must be good if you're He's talking very, about very, him. very good. Yeah. And actually, like, so like I started steering more towards the instrumental stuff like that. We're talking Steve Vai and your Satriani. Surfing with and, the alien. Oh, totally, dude. I mean, that was like when I was in high school and I heard that for the first time. I was like, this dude is the man. Like, I don't know why. Like, yeah. I feel like Satriani can write a instrumental song that sounds like there there could be words to it, and you don't even have to have them there, you know. But man, that's where you and I differ because well, or I'm sorry, maybe I'm go in a different direction with this but uh that's what this is for uh, yeah i i have a lot of directions i can that i jump around but so when i i've i've listened to that shred music you know like i in the same like context that i listen to all the other music and the stuff that interests me and i don't hate it but it doesn't do for me what i think it does for other people and Another thing too, because I love electric guitars, but like I, I don't know, like I, lo- I just love that classic nineteen fifties tube amp, you know, single coils or, or humbuckers, whatever. But like, just a cranked tube amp mm-hmm. and not a bunch of like, not not a bunch of uh, messing around with it, you know, like just 
give me that nasty sound yeah. and that that that's what i love and i feel like with those guys it's like they've done all these i don't it, it, there's just too many gadgets and gizmos and toys and modifications to get like the perfect whatever and it's like well i i feel like that's inside your head i don't know i'm not i'm not hating on anybody and you know it's like you listen to like eddie van halen play eruption which was kind of like a game changer and it's like yeah that's really cool and then there's just like this whole like thing that followed how's it going we got a visitor yeah, I, I get it. There's there is that, but like I mean, there's people that are like, well, he stole the concept for eruption from X Y Z, you know, and that person actually borrowed from this other person. And I like watch this whole YouTube video of like who actually like because everyone's like eruption. Nobody's ever done anything remotely close to that before, and yeah, before in the entire you know history of the guitar. But there's actually been people who have done it before. Well, so maybe it was the finger tapping. That, that's the thing. That yeah, like, yeah. Nobody. People, well, well, maybe people did it before him, but he was the one that really brought it to the mainstream for whatever reason right? yeah yeah right? i mean to an extent there was there's some like italian guitar <clears throat> player that used to do it like on tv like that apparently everyone knew like a million years ago and everything was black and white right not to be like it's a million years ago sorry everybody um <laughs> sorry to our older listeners uh but no i i guess what i'm getting at though is just like that that like guitar wizard stuff it's like i just like things that are simple and it's like and it's like like all you need is like a 1950s strat and a you know a tube amp cranked up to 10 and like that that to me is this you know just like that blues sound and and the country sound from that's what i love mm-hmm. and when i hear that i'm just thinking of like cliffs of dover and yeah. i'm just like yeah and i just like i don't i don't like the way that guitar sounds it's like oh too like processed and stuff uh, i will say that i don't hate it but like it literally doesn't picking the guy who has like the most anal retentive guitar tone arguments ever it, like, you really he's yeah. he's weird with what he wants but yeah like i've read about like all sorts of stuff he likes to have like a wet dry wet setup with like panned stereo effects yeah. so they go in from one end to the next but the center is always gonna be dry with no effects on it so you have like a blended it's this big to do uh he's he's weirdo yeah eric johnson but, he's but like i good. probably think <clears throat> i probably think that i'm so right about what i believe in but it, it's just a matter of taste right yeah. it honestly is you know uh that i think about guitar tone all the time like just all the time. Oh, I do too. And it's like, but you know, what you come to realize when you've played enough electric guitar or whatever, or, you know, played live enough, you realize that like, depending on the venue and the kind of band you're playing in, like you can just stick like a little line six modeling amp in there. And like, if, you know, like if in mic it or, or play direct or what, and like, you know, if the focus isn't that much on the guitar, then it's almost like it doesn't matter. It might ma- well, it might matter to you on stage, like what you're hearing, and I mean that matters. Don't get me wrong, but it's just like the more I don't know, it's the the more the guitar becomes the less of the focus within the grand scheme of things the less those little details matter. But you as the guitar player, you're 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 one piece of that puzzle and you want to make your piece I don't know. It totally makes sense. So like you're saying if it was if it was just you and you're the only one playing the guitar tone, yeah, it would is definitely it, very important. Yeah. Very important. Because when you're in a nine piece band with horns and stuff. It's not as not important as because important. you're blending in with everything else. It, and a lot of those refined things are gonna get lost in the nonsense. And the sound guy is gonna be hitting the EQ, whatever, that's gonna drown out that thing that you thought was so you know, like it's it could just, happen, yeah. I mean that's very much a thing. Uh, I mean, that comes to, like, going to jam nights and thing. I, I used to have a pedal board that I would bring with me everywhere, like a safety blanket. Yeah. You know, it was just like, if I have this, I can have any amp and I can make it sound good. And then I eventually was just like, I'm going to go somewhere with just a combo amp and no pedal board. And, like, whatever's on the amp is what I get. Like, it has a clean channel and a non-clean channel, and that's that's it. It's like the end yeah, of the story. when so. you're moving heavy crap around, you want to be efficient. And, pretty much. Pretty much. Uh, but it kind of like restricted me. I didn't have my safety blanket anymore. Right. So it made me kind of figure out like, well, what sounds good on this, you know, this time. And like to the point where you and I were talking about like a PV Classic 30 has a boost switch on it. And I always play with it on. It's just the way I prefer it. But I, I went, 
a few months playing with it off just to do it just to try it because i'm like I, you just don't don't turn it on you have to just figure out a way to make it sound good something close to your tone whatever you can get to use it but uh well it'll break up too if you crank it but it, it won't like get as nasty and, and as loud mm-hmm. as with the boost but yeah yeah and i i just feel like uh with an electric guitar you gotta you gotta know and you know the amp is is the most important part really because well i don't know you whatever it's all about the weakest link in the chain right but like i would argue the amp and the guitar pickup <laughs> those are like the two things yeah yeah the pickup and the amp yep. but um i mean the, that's and if everybody wants to argue i'll show you a video where a guy made a guitar made right air and it right. sounded exactly the same as you want to you i mean you want to love the way your guitar feels but ultimately it's a it's the sound is like what's gonna make people dance and whatnot but um or make them cry or whatever you're going for but you have to making people cry man what's wrong uh, with what's wrong with you <laughs> i know i didn't i know i didn't listen to emo very much back in high school but you know whatever you know sometimes <laughs> it's tears of joy maybe maybe uh but I, you know, pe- I, I don't want to like disparage anyone or be negative and stuff, but, but, um, You're gonna power through it anyway. Like I, I, I go, <laughs> I go, I play at a lot of these like public, you know, jam things and mm-hmm. I wish I could get to more. <sighs> yeah. But it's just like, I, I just, I, I get annoyed by guitar pedals <laughs> because, I, uh, it, it, Yes. You know, you, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's but, extra stuff on the floor. It takes extra time. It's more cables. It's, hey, EQ it like and this. And also just like you would have this, you've got a great amp. Like you, would, if you just play straight into your amp, like, and turn it up, that's all you got to do. Maybe you need a smaller amp mm-hmm. um, be for the room size, but uh uh, just, uh, the, uh, like you gotta, you gotta be able to make your amp sound good without all that crap. And then once you figure that out, then you can start throwing that crap in there. In my opinion, my yeah. humble opinion, I feel like that's like the one one you know, the fundamentals of playing electric guitars, figuring out how to make that amp sound because the first time I plugged into a tube amp, I, I remember it like, I, cause I didn't own a tube, you know, I just had like a modeler when I was a kid in high school. And, um, you know, I, I love playing with the effects and doing all the goofy stuff and, you know, turn it up with the, on the metal channel and having my mom get pissed at me or whatever. And it then it sounds like a can of bees, right? <laughs> it, it, it sounded cool, but in obnoxious and whatever, but, but I remember that. And then I started like reading, like, Oh, tube amps are where it's at and it's like okay and i i remember the first time i ever did it was uh at um i think it, it was at bob's guitars in cedar cedar fall or waterloo waterloo maybe or cedar falls one of the two um but um i was just like yeah do you, do you guys have tube amps here and, you know i was like 18 years old and like, oh yeah you know they got all these tube amps and mm-hmm. i want to say it was like a fender twin or fender deluxe something like that it, it was it was a big big boy and uh i realized like oh you just turn the volume knob up and then like all these sounds that are coming out of it are like uh just like sounds that i couldn't get out of the modeling amp like mm-hmm. it's just like the it, i mean it's the same basic sound but there's all these little details and like overtones or whatever i don't even know the terminology for it but like just that pure like thing and it's like this is what i hear when i go to concerts and when i listen to records and stuff and it's not the same as this cheap little amp that i'm playing not that those things aren't great they serve a purpose and i learned i learned stuff from it and you know they're convenient they're lightweight but um but yeah it's like i i love two amps i do and i i like i i just like to be basic and simple and effective i just like something that just punches you in the nuts when you hear it (laughs) and um and it doesn't take much to do that you know just a few hundred bucks and you can get a decent tube amp that will be way too loud for your house you know and or or maybe the right amount of volume and that you can really uh put you know i'm trying to formulate the right sentence for this put 
cause a lot of punishment. <laughs> I don't know. No, I, not violence. No, just like make something beautiful with it. Yeah. I mean, I feel like with, especially with tube amps, a lot of people are like, I mean, you're sitting in a room that like off camera does have some tube amps in it. A few. But, yeah. <laughs> but, but like, I mean, a lot of what's here is like 100 watt amps. Nobody needs 100 watt amps. Anymore. Right. It's so stupid. And yeah. I mean, like to say like, yeah, crank one of those up. They sound <clears> great. <throat> well, they do, but... You're going to destroy eardrums, like, in any room. But you live on a farm, so, I, like... I can do it if I wanted to, which I have a few times. Yeah. And, and it's it's violently loud. Yeah. Like, it's yeah. violently loud. But, like, I mean, a cl- I have a classic 30. That's what I bring to jam nights, a little 30-watt amp. And uh, 30 watts, people are like, that's not very loud. Well, I can, I can roar with that thing, you know? Yeah. I've got a 10-watt amp that's even still pretty loud. So, like... You could crank that thing all the way up, and some venue owners would be like, "Turn it down, come on!" Right? You know, oh, like, yeah. oh yeah, it's, it doesn't take much to really crank them up. So there is a YouTube video out there. Maybe you've seen it, maybe you haven't. But um, of this guy that lives in a place kind of like this, and well, he's like way out in the middle of nowhere, and somewhere down south, I think. And he had his friend like drive two miles away, and he he's got an old Plex, Marshall Plexi, and he cranks it all the way up and plays it, and then they they like go to his buddy's like you know iphone and it's like you can hear it two miles away just yeah, like crazy. howling through the trees and it's oh my god that's cool crazy. that's cool it would be fun that to was hook up some some ampage out here and play. hendrix and clapton were having a, f- a lot of fun with those back in the day oh my gosh i could just imagine especially back in the day like that's like they didn't microphone up people's guitar amps, so you needed like right. twenty of them to right. fill a You stadium. needed you needed all the juice you could get, and then you needed to have a bunch of those on hand because they would always be catching on fire. Or, yep, blowing you know. up or something. Yeah, it was a lot of malfunctions, and and that's yeah. why the that's why the top cab is actually angled because it would project up to the higher end, like into the stands and stuff for people uh, sitting. That's like supposedly what it was for. Right pretty, pretty wild, yeah. I don't know. So. We're actually like way far into this. That's all right. I can I can talk for hours. You know? uh, yeah. Okay. So you, when did you first pick up a guitar? Like, who was your inspiration to pick up a guitar? It was you, Peter Stockton. Uh, I d- highly doubt that. No, but I do have a story. Do you want me to hear it? Yes, it involves you. Oh it my gosh, you. this is gonna be embarrassing. Let's hear. It. I know. Do you want to be? In- yeah. 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 yeah Lay it on. I have. I have to do you, it. You know, it's. What it's if inevitable. I just said no and everyone listening was like, Oh, come on! <clears throat> Edit. <laughs> I don't know if it's really that embarrassing. It's Hit just it. like uh, we've already like treaded the the fact that we grew up in the same town but um so okay so i started playing guitar when i was 14 the year was 2006 about to turn 15 right mm-hmm, yeah, yeah 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 um like october of 2006 so uh like when i was in seventh grade um uh to the to the story because i was in seventh grade in 2005 and um I saw you play at the talent show and with uh, active input Ooh, green day. Yeah. Yep. I remember seeing you cause you had long hair. I remember black, black hair, right? Yep. You were in a muscle shirt. Yep. And I remember, I don't know, sometimes you make fun of your uh, younger self on your show. And then I was like, I remember that. <laughs> yep. And I just, I was sitting in the crowd and you, meow, 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 I walk alone. And I remember that. Yep. And then uh, I remember the next day I was riding in the car with my dad and he's like, um, well, no, it was, we, were li- we were listening to the radio, riding in the car, and, he, and the song was Another One Bites the Dust by Queen. Maybe that's why I started listening to Queen. I don't know. But he's like, you think you could play this at the talent show that they let you? There's some uh, there's some uh, funny things he's saying in there, like inappropriate, you know, like mm-hmm. you know, school teacher father saying crap like that. And I know, but he's, like, but he's right, though. There's, right, there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of stuff. interesting things. Back in but, the day, they were better at hiding it, though. True. Yep. Well, and then if you play that song backwards, it says Smoke Marijuana. Oh, geez. Which, have you not ever no, done that? No. Oh, okay. Didn't inhale. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, the uh, Yeah, but it it does sound like he says that, and but I don't think it was on purpose, obviously. But, um, and I have the record, and I've done it, you know, or my dad had the record, and I guess I have the record too. But, um, so anyhow, that just like had this image in my mind, of, like me playing in the talent show. And it's like, oh, could I do that? And, uh, and like I said, I got into Queen around that time, which, you know, obviously I was just, the song was a Queen song. And I remember I got the, the DVD Queen live at Wembley and like watching, um, John Deacon play bass 
you know, and he's got some, you know, like another one bites the dust under pressure, like those really distinct bass lines. And I remember just thinking like, I could do that because like, mm-hmm. I can play the trombone pretty well. And like, uh, the, uh, but then you see Brian May and, and I was like, that's a bunch of sorcery. I have no clue yeah. what he's doing uh, there. And yeah. I, I don't think I'm capable of doing that. Yep. And, uh, and I, I remember like he, hearing like, um, like a, some Santana song on the radio and just like that sustain that he's got. And, and I remember like seeing somebody play an acoustic guitar around that and just be like, why doesn't it like, why doesn't the note last that long? Like mm-hmm. that, I, that didn't make sense to me. That's something I kind of, I guess, figured out later. Um, but so um, I, to, to answer your question, um, I, when I was in uh, ninth grade, uh, like I said, I wanted to play bass, um, but I just never did because there wasn't one around and I didn't, I don't know. I don't know. It never was a, big enough priority i guess because i played like in the jazz band and stuff at school and like but i played trombone there's somebody else playing bass it wasn't like we need you to jump in patrick it's it's your time you know and i i don't know it never hit me but then uh i was really listening to the chili peppers hard and um the song venice queen um has that it's like a i'm pretty sure it's like a classical guitar at the end i haven't listened to it in a while but it's, it's like the coda at the end it's like and i was just i remember like thinking like okay that's an acoustic guitar my dad has an acoustic guitar. Maybe I could figure that out. And so like I got on the internet, figured out like the language of tablature and, uh, mm-hmm. and, uh, I think it's just like an E minor chord to like a D and like, you know, with, you know, very little, uh, practice, you can sort of figure out how to fret those two things on the E minor chord. So I think I sort of got that down and was just like, Oh, Okay guess I'm a guitar player now. Yeah, <laughs> I don't yeah. know if I got like the D chord or whatever comes after that, but, um, and then, uh, I, you know, my dad sort of caught wind and I started looking up other chili peppers, um, songs. So those of you who want to like learn how to play guitar, like other side by the red hot chili peppers is a good song to learn. Cause it's really easy. Um, distinct little guitar riff. Um, but, um, so my dad's classroom was across from Tim Miller's and my dad's like, Oh, I'll get you a, a Mel Bay book. That's what I learned on. And, um, so he showed up the next day with, uh, with the guitar Mel Bay, like beginner guitar book. And I just use that to, uh, learn how to do stuff, I guess. But I, I didn't, uh, you know, just, you know, I played a few little riffs. I sort of had the cowboy chords figured out bar chords, but it, it, you know, my dad's got this old seventies jumbo acoustic guitar that's never been set up or anything. And, you know, it's kind of rough, like trying to do that. But for my birthday that year, we went to the store in Fort Dodge that was like going out of business. I don't, I'm sure you remember, but I don't know what it was called. Right by the train tracks. Yeah. Fort Dodge music center. Oh, (laughs) otherwise, otherwise, uh, no, Chris Carr was still in business. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Fort that Dodge, that Fort was Dodge it. Music yeah. Center. Yeah. And, uh, it, Fort Dodge Music oh, Center. Oh, they had a song. Turn it on <laughs> and turn it up. Oh, my gosh. If someone can find me one of those shirts, I would love it. Somebody reprint those shirts. Who could be in charge of that? Somebody's well, listening has got to know. Shouldn't, Anyways. There be, shouldn't there be one that's like Rediscover the Crossroads Mall? That was their. That uh, <laughs> <laughs> I would still buy the Fort Dodge Music Center shirt before that. But you get, you get my joke. They're tearing down the mall. Yeah, yes. But they have that jingle Rediscover the Crossroads yeah, Mall. Like re- rediscover it. Like, uh, I don't know. It's funny. It's Disco- funny. Discovered in small town, town humor. Yes. <laughs> um, okay. So you go to Fort Dodge Music Center, and I, they, my my lovely mother and father bought me my red PV Raptor that my dad still jams out on today with its strings that probably haven't been changed in the past five years. They're corroded, and you know. So PV Raptor. Did I say PV Raptor? Yes. Yeah, and the Line Six little uh, spider spider amp. Cool. And uh, yeah, so that'd, I that'd be all you'd need. Honestly. Right, right. Mess around on that, and then I like subscribe to Guitar World or yeah, Guitar World. And, nice. And it's like a lot of that was gibberish, you know. Mm-hmm. But then there's a couple things that sort of made sense to me. But um, I then uh, yeah, I really didn't progress until uh i would say when i was like in 10th grade um because i decided that um i think if i remember correctly it was uh hurt was the song because i watched the the video 
uh, Hurt by Johnny Cash, you know, it's written by Trent Reznor, of course. Got to give credit where credit is due, but, you know, because I'd heard that was like the most amazing music video, and I was always just like, had no interest in Johnny Cash because it's like, I, I hate country music. I, I you know, just yeah. growing up, like, yeah. oh, yeah. oh yeah, hearing like the radio country and just like, oh, oh no. Yeah, Barfaroni. Oh, mm, oh. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, Johnny Cash, but I watched the video and was just like floored by it, you know, and I mm-hmm. think most people, a lot of people would, would tell you the same thing. And it's, um, but I remember like he's playing an acoustic guitar and, uh, it, it just looks like simple stuff that he's doing. So I, I was, I think I just like made it a goal that like, what if I could play a whole song from start to finish? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a goal. That's a noble goal for a well, beginning yeah. guitarist. Right. And, and it was hard too. Cause it's, I don't know. It's like this stamina in my fingers would just like wear out or something. And I don't know. But and I told myself if I like just work at it for like 30 minutes a night, like every night for like a month, let's see like what can happen. And so of course, after like a week, like I had that one down and it was like, all right, what's the next one? And I don't, mm-hmm. I don't even know what that was, but you know, just started adding more songs to the repertoire. And I think I found myself just kind of like, Oh, I can kind of like mumble the words over it, you know? And I had never sung Um, I was never encouraged to sing really. And, um, but, uh, yeah. So I, I, I'd say I I had songs in my repertoire at that time. And then when I was in the 11th grade, I started playing at like the talent shows and stuff at at school. And, um, how did that go for you? Good, good experience at your first talent show. Yeah. Yeah. It was good. Um, I played Alice in Chains. Nice. And I didn't have a drummer, but I had a guy named Chris Clayball playing bass. Oh, nice. The old, the old bass and guitar band. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, He had a, an older sibling that was yep, near my yep. age. Um, but yeah, I think I think I had uh, graduated to the PV amp uh, the, with uh, PV, PV Viper. Oh, nice. The, yep. From the spider to the viper. Yep. And, the, and, it, and I had like the foot switch thing with it oh. so i could like tear into oh a gnarly solo so the, i the san para yeah san para yeah, yeah yeah look at me with my pv oh knowledge. i you know i i got a friend in cedar rapids that is like he loves the pv crap too for some reason i don't know it's, i'm not knocking it but dude, it's a stupid obsession <laughs> but i love it i love it uh yeah so um so i did that and uh some johnny cash stuff later and uh rolling stones wearing goofy outfits just you know trying to be silly because if you're serious then people you you know that whole like insecurity that you have when Mm -hmm. you're you know i i work at a high school and i see it you know it's like you you can't ask kids like in front of the whole class like what music they listen to because they'll like they'll Mm, you know maybe that's more of a middle school thing but um i don't know uh but uh yeah the uh so i I, uh, yeah, yeah. So I, I was doing that and then, um, it was kind of like unsatisfying because it was like, uh, where, where do I go with this next? You know? And like music is such a, ex- well, electric guitar and all that, um, is expensive. And like, you are constantly being pressured by yourself and by, you just want to upgrade everything all the time, you know? And then there's just like, <laughs> I have no clue. What you're yeah. Yeah. About. Yeah. And you know, the, the gear acquisition syndrome, but yep, like, yep. it's not practical. And like, you could, if you're dumb, you can like convince yourself that like, once I get that thing, then I will finally have achieved like this level that I need to be at. And it's like, no, the, uh, well, you come to figure out later, like, no, the truth is you need to make the most out of what you have and you need to go out and play a lot and enjoy doing it and do it for the right reasons and all that. And then you're just going to, it's going to be a slow climb mm-hmm. and, uh, and it's going to be a lot of fun, but I don't know. So, but you know, I went to college and then it was like, um, uh, you know, I was hoping I'd meet all these people and, uh, somehow, uh, form some kind of, a radiohead esque band that would just take off into the stratosphere and uh and I met some people right away. I played a show like within the first couple months there and uh um but uh I, I, I kinda fizzled. But then I met like my friends that became like my 
you know, hardcore friends for life. And they're all like musicians and like, we've done various things together since. And one of them was the original guitar player in my, uh, musical entity that I'm currently doing. And, um, anyhow, so, but, and I started playing open mics in college, but I didn't do that until like my junior year or like the end of my sophomore year. And, um, the, uh, that takes a lot of guts. You're like, 20, it was it was scary yeah because you're going into a bar in like in iowa city there, there's they're very, men in there men with jobs jerry yeah yeah it's, it's like reference. it's like a different thing than like the high school thing um but uh yeah so playing open mics was like a different world and like i i like wasn't even legally old enough to drink and at the time and um the in iowa city it, it's it has such a reputation for being like the alcohol capital of the world that yeah. like uh they the, the the school and in some ways the city are very like not lousy fair about stuff so like the, but they but they allowed like the mill had some uh some clause where like if someone is going there to play at, at j knight's open mic then on Monday nights, then they can be however old they want until a certain hour. So like anyhow, or something like that. I don't yeah, know what it was, that, but there's it, a caveat with a lot of those places based on how they function. If they're a music venue, blah, blah, this, every city's different, but it's yeah, usually, they usually yeah. they have a curfew of some sort. Right. If you're a musician. But I do remember that first night that I played there, I was there till like midnight because my roommate was there and he turned 21 at midnight on my first night that I played there. Anyhow, but that, that started a long, uh, interesting relationship with, uh, with Jay Knight, who's who ran that open mic f from 1981 until COVID took out the mill, which was an amazing place in Iowa City. I don't oh, know if you wow. ever went there. Uh -uh. Um, they had all these cool, um, smaller band shows. I would by smaller I mean like bands that aren't extremely popular but are national touring acts, you know. And it's just mm -hmm. this grungy place with tables and. Uh, I don't know. It was awesome. It was magical. And like, you know, they tried to preserve it as a historical landmark and it just, they just couldn't make it happen. So it was demolished a few months ago, finally. Um, and, um, uh, I'm sure it's just going to be more luxury high rise apartments yeah. going up in place, but yep. whatever. But, but Jay, but Jay has two open mics now and one of them is closer to me. Ooh, cool. Um, and, um, it's kind of become, sort of sort of magical because he runs it the same way he did and i hope i hope it you know that the business is good there and they they keep it going um but um you know it's, it's on a farm oh, <laughs> not, cool. not an audible farm not but uh yeah. it, but it's on a it's uh at sutliff cider that they, they i feel like they sell quite a bit of cider but anyhow they, amazing food great restaurant beautiful place just south of mount vernon to the east of cedar rapids and uh um oh yeah so that I've, I've been having a good time playing at that open mic and, uh, you know, just showing up and playing with people who are signed up. And anyhow, that that's a long winded way of saying that, uh, that was the next step was playing open mics. All right. So we're going to, we're getting close to where we're at today. So, Oh, we got a we no, limit. No, we're, well, no, we're getting, we're getting really close though. It's just kind right. of funny how it all just comes together really well like this, but we're about an hour in. And so you start doing. Do you want me to just like give you the the TLDR version? Where no, I just like no, no, we're good, we're good. Keep okay. going. So we're like, uh, you're doing the open mic nights and things like that, yeah, and yeah. you have a band, don't you? That, I have an sort? entity, musical yeah. entity. I don't okay. like. I don't want to call it a collective. Um, I don't want to call it a band either. It's not uh, an ensemble. <laughs> well, it's it's basically. It didn't start out that way. It started out as a duo. My name's Patrick. Um, my guitar player's name is John. His middle name is Patrick. But I would say I'm Patrick. This is John Patrick. We are Patrick the Gathering. Uh, went, you know, as like a Magic the Gathering. It's a game that I enjoy playing since I was a wee little lad. And so so did John, John Patrick. And it's also funny because John Patrick's younger brother's name is Patrick. He's the, they've, he's a 
third of four boys. And so it's like, it's, it seemed like they didn't think they were going to have another boy, <laughs> another kid or another boy. This is John Patrick, this is Patrick John. Yeah. And so like anybody else that ever like sat in with us, I would like throw Patrick onto their name. But, um, and then he moved earlier this year and I replaced him with, uh, a gentleman named Todd, who's pretty awesome. And I've just decided that I am the dictator. Um, it's not a democracy and I will pay people and tell them what to do. And, um, that because works. otherwise nobody's going to want to play with me because I have a deep voice and then that means they got to play quiet and they got to play around me and I love lyrics and it's not about showing off. It's about making me look good. <laughs> yeah. hey, I've actually come to terms with some of that. It's, it took a while as like somebody who's a paid musician to do that. But after a while you're like, Oh, this is where I fit in. I can still get my licks in. Everything's cool. You know? And, right. You know, right. everybody's got that you know gmsi you know get my shit in kind of feeling sorry yeah sorry about the profanity everybody it's all it's all good but uh the uh yeah i just i've come to learn that like the democratic process might work if it's like lennon mccartney and george Harris. you know like if if you're in this (laughs) giant city and, and not just them but like um i'm not saying i don't know it's like if if you want like the the democratically working band in a lot of bands it's like you don't know if it's a democracy or if like one you kind of figure out like like with smashing pumpkins and stuff like it's billy corgan's band but in the beginning it wasn't necessarily that way it might seem but anyhow um i just think that like you got to have like some serious talent in your band if uh if you want everybody everybody's uh input to be like equally uh, I don't know. I don't know. There's like the, the politics of it is, is, a uh, is a tricky thing. And I think you have to have an executive to some, you know, a band leader. Absolutely. Um, I, I honestly think so too. But, um, but yeah, I mean, and, and I just, sometimes I see bands and it seems like everybody's just trying to exhibit their skills and techniques and stuff and like everyone that's in the band and it takes away from the song and it's all about the song like if you don't have a good song it's not and you know in jazz music is kind of a different thing where it's like it is kind of just people showing off but that's the nature of the thing but you know jazz music and pop music or whatever you know it's it's different i but it it, for for what i do because you know i don't like to do the five minute guitar solo and stuff like that I've, i have been known to play a little excess harmonica but um <laughs> yeah it's just like i I'm, I'm all about the lyrics that's what it comes down to. like lyrics singing and just like putting on a good show and like keeping that energy going and like it's all about the finished product and that's uh that's uh that's what i go for so so you, so you don't have, we were talking earlier you don't have any social media for your band um, I have, I have social media for me right. and, um, <clears throat> sometimes people like call me Patrick the gathering, mm-hmm. which I understand the confusion. Mm-hmm. Um, but, um, yeah, it's like, uh, I, I guess I, I've gotten in the habit now. If I go to an open mic and there's like a sign up sheet, I just put like Patrick T unless like Todd is with me. Then I put Patrick the gathering and, um, Whereas for a while I was going to him alone and putting Patrick the Gathering, so I guess that's where. And also, like the old people call it Patrick and the Gathering. They don't. They don't understand like that. They don't. Yeah. They don't get the reference. But yeah. um, anyhow, uh, yeah. So so I don't. I I you know I've teetered with the idea because I have been getting like the the randos on social media like adding me and. And honestly, I feel like if they talk to me after my show, then I would like no, I would like remember them. But like, hundred percent, I've been over this on my podcast. I think it's people times. who spend a lot of time on Facebook, maybe, and then they, um, they see that we have a lot of friends in common, and Facebook shoves it in their face, and maybe they are sort of vaguely aware of who I am, or maybe they just think that looks like a cool person. I want to be their friend. Yeah, it's somebody <laughs> with a guitar, their profile picture uh, ad, or whatever, you know. Yeah, and then and. Yeah, so I'm... Uh, Trust me, I get it. Yeah. yeah I try. So I, I, I want to do the social media thing once I have like enough gigs booked where it's just like a hub for people to be like, oh, when's Patrick playing another show? I want to go see him. Well, how do you know there aren't already people like that? Because uh, where's your next show? Uh, September 10th at the Red Frog. There we go. So but you- my So like the last... Well, I know we got to wrap this up, but the last time I played there... Whatever. It's like I, 
it's not nepotism. Uh, it's like, I'm trying to, well, I'm not, it's when you work at a place and there's a lot of people that work there and you know, a lot of people and it's like, Oh, I can see how many of these people I can get to go to my show. And so that's like, that's kind of like my marketing angle, I guess, is people I know. Cause I didn't grow up in Cedar Rapids. I grew up here and, um, uh, and there's a lot more stuff there to distract a person. Oh, so yeah. it's, it's harder to get people to go out to shows, but I just kind of start with the people who are in my orbit, which is coworkers and mm -hmm. other people, uh, musicians really. And, and once, once I find myself like, so the red frog, I love playing at the red frog, uh, shout out to the red frog in the Czech village. Um, but it's a small place and I, I packed it pretty well for like my standards last time I played there a few months back. And so my next show there, I'm, I'm really hoping I can like fill it to the brim. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but I, I would love it if it happened. That would be and, awesome. And then, and maybe at that point I would consider getting a social media page. I don't oh, know. geez. <laughs> well, I don't have any links for you, unfortunately. Oh, you want links. Stuff. Oh, well, okay. So I do have a YouTube channel. Oh, okay. So um, we'll at least put a YouTube channel. Yeah. Up. Yeah. And Everybody go to the YouTube channel, hit subscribe. Just do it. Oh, trust me. well, yeah, it's just like random uh videos of me singing and then um also uh just like you know when my friends are playing at an open mic or just like like last night i was jamming with you guys and it's like i just want to capture like one video of one good song and throw it on there and oh, we oh. didn't play very good and you didn't get any good songs no, i got one I'm just, I'm just i got one it was good it was good um and uh, i call it the the it's called gravel beach which is uh from a kurt well, okay, so I discovered it from a uh, Raymond Carver story, and I also saw that Kurt Vonnegut also used it. I recently discovered that a term, gravel beach. I feel like it describes Iowa pretty well, right? Maybe? No? Uh, I don't okay. Know. Anyway, that, so I always thought that'd be a good name for a band, and that's just what the YouTube channel ended up being called. So I just throw all that crap on there, and, um, um, and, and I have a record that I'm making, a single two songs nice. a side and a b side um and that i i am going to be working i i need to re-record the vocals i think so i'm going to do that on sunday and then help or my guy is uh, uh we we gotta switch a few things around the mix and i have a guy that i have been told is the guy i need to go to for mastering and then i uh, I want it to be on Spotify so that people can add it to their barbecue playlist um, and that when they are driving in their car and they don't feel like going to work, they have something that can brighten up their day a little bit, even if some of the lyrics are maybe a little dark. But um, mm -hmm. I got two songs that uh, um, that I felt were worth recording and, uh, and then uh, maybe that'll... You know that you, you know, spread spread stuff around, and maybe more people will come to the shows at that point. But you know, performing live is what I really love doing. Um, but it's it's it makes a difference when you got a packed house and a lot of energy in there. You know? Yeah, definitely, that's, definitely. That's uh, that's what I live for. You know. All right. At the beginning of this, you were asking me about shout outs. Oh yeah. How yeah, many yeah. shout outs do you want to make? Oh, uh, thirty seconds. 30 oh, seconds. It's, well, it's, do I, we have thirty seconds? We got more. I got endless recording time. <laughs> All right. All it, right. Oh, thank God this isn't on tapes anymore. Could you imagine if this was on tapes, like on a reel spinning in the background? It'd be cool because then we could convince someone to spend a lot of money on it. You know? <laughs> um, Every episode of podcast costs like a thousand dollars. Yeah, I'm just saying, like for like the whole hipster angle, like oh yeah, this podcast is on analog tape. It's like on you... analog tape only. Yeah, <laughs> just imagine, like, uh, I don't know, I don't know how much recorded audio is out there now as opposed to like 50 years ago when oh yeah that, you know, it's just like i can imagine pressing all that to vinyl it would be a lot Ugh. all right ladies and gentlemen um i want to say well first i want to say uh a, a hello to all my f my fans in uh europe and asia i don't know if i have any in australia and africa but if you're listening then uh hello uh love you guys Shout outs to uh, Todd Porter for putting up with me. Um, to uh, Dan from Maze with Three A's. That's uh, the shirt I'm wearing for letting me play at his at the Gabe's Musical Variety Show in Iowa City. Um, that's a lot of fun. Shout out to uh, Fred for letting me play at Fred Stock. He plays in uh, Palomino, Five of Hearts, and Corey Baker in the Secret Sauce. Awesome band from uh, 
from uh, uh, Cedar Rapids. Cool. Shout out to Jay Knight uh, for being awesome, running the open mic at Sutliff Cider. Shout outs to uh, Dave and Julie for running the open mic at the Red Frog. That's a ton of fun. Um, and a shout out to Mike McMeans at Fathead Productions for helping me with my record um, and for uh, everything else he's helped me with. So um, that's, I, I got more shout outs that I could give, but I'm not going to give them because um, that, you know, you got to leave them begging for more. Right? Yeah. Right? You gotta stop somewhere. Otherwise, right. just, otherwise we would have just had an whole episode of shout outs. Like we said, <laughs> well, you, but you told me I could do that if I wanted. if you to. really want to next episode, you're going to have, an, you're just going to talk about your social media page, your new album. And you're just going to shout out for like 45 minutes. Uh, something like that. There yeah. might be like one or two random stories about Britney Spears in there as well. Rock and roll, rock and roll. You got to stay consistent, you know? Well, the last episode we were like, bringing up like elvis and garth brooks and stuff and i was just like jeez this is out of my wheelhouse but yeah let's talk about it you know you don't like elvis uh i, I haven't sat down and listened to a bunch oh. of it and i'll tell you what i'm not going out of my way to watch one of his movies I'm sure. <laughs> the the new elvis movie can i just say no i'm I, talking like a, a movie elvis okay recorded. Yeah. i don't want to see him in right. a hawaiian shirt all tanned right. up on an island I can know. i just say though i hate uh musician biopics i really do because you know, from the rock and roll era or whatever, like there's so much, so much good, like documentary footage and, um, and here they are saucing it up with extra drama. Oh yeah. And then when you know the history of the band, like the queen one, like there were so many historical inaccuracies. And as a person that really loves that band, I was just like, it just, it it was just cringy. And I know like, don't get me wrong. Like in, in all these movies, like the, the doors move, like the acting performances are amazing. But like, I just feel gross watching, watching those things. Cause it's near and dear to my heart, those stories. And then when I know that things have been changed and then just seeing it dramatized rather than just watching this amazing documentary footage that exists out there. Yeah. And then there's all these awesome documentaries already made about these bands. Mm-hmm. I just, I, you know, they're money makers, but like, they make me feel gross. Do you like documentaries? <laughs> Do you like drama? Do you want your documentaries to have more drama? Are you. <laughs> I don't know what that's from. I, I'm just making it up. Oh, yeah. Are you inconvenienced know. by the facts in your documentaries? Right, right. <laughs> Try we'll, biopics. We'll <laughs> oh put it gosh. in the Hollywood money machine. So horrible. But I, they're, uh, yes, you said it great, though. They're They're great to watch and stuff, but when you know the history of what's going on, you're just like. I just feel like I was robbed of the first 40 minutes of this. Like, now I don't yeah. even want to finish it. You know, it's just like, oh, you were doing so good up until now. Well, my parents were like, did, did you see the Elvis movie? We saw it the other night. It was at the Hamoda. It was great. And I'm like, like four years ago, I watched the four hour HBO documentary about Elvis. Like, what am I? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I don't need to see Tom Hanks in a fat suit. Like, <laughs> you know, I, I, I just, I don't, I don't want to, awesome. I don't want to go down that route. Oh man, it was probably good if it was Tom Hanks. Though. I'll tell you that's no, it was a different guy playing Elvis. Okay. Tom Hanks was playing the Colonel, who's like Elvis's evil manager. The Colonel, yeah, yeah. Colonel yeah. Sanders, baby. I'm yeah. Just kidding. Well, know. he's a Southern gentleman. There we go. Good old boy. It all works. Everybody in the South, their name was Colonel for some reason. For some reason, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I wasn't there. This is a great way to end this podcast. We went on a on a Elvis rant again for two weeks in a row. We've got brought Elvis up on the podcast. Really? Oh, yeah. cool. It's awesome. That's has, has that one aired yet? Uh, the other one actually technically has not aired. Oh, okay. I was going to say, like, because you know I listen to every You do episode. listen. You're probably like, wait, you know, uh, I don't remember yeah. talking about Elvis. I can, so tomorrow I'm going to listen. And I will we're listen. We're going to talk about Elvis. To that, and I'm, I'll be waiting. You're going to be yelling at the microphone. It's going to be You're like a the- ticking time bomb. I'll probably, I don't know. I don't know what I'll be doing, but I'm probably going to be slapping my knee. There you go. There it is. There the it Elvis is. reference. That's the spot. That's the spot. All right. All right. You want to be done? We're Let's done. Be done. All right. All right. Thanks, man. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs> Yeah, what I tell you, Patrick's fun. He's fun to hang out with. Uh, it's it's fun. Like I said, I've gotten to play with him at shows. I've gotten to hear him play. I've gotten to listen to him. You know, it's really fun to to know somebody that uh, was from my town is out there doing this uh, just like I am. You know, there's a few of us out there. There's a few of us. You know, growing up in a small town in Iowa, there's not not too much to do. You know, especially pre-internet and one of those post-internet kids made it through and is playing music. I think some of them are actually better than some of us. You know, just, but uh, I don't know. What's your take on that? Uh, pre-internet or post-internet? Did you like growing up without uh, the ability to look things up? or Because or, I'll tell you what. like have Having the internet around as an adult and using it to learn how to play guitar. Holy cow. 
But uh, yeah, that's not what that's not what we're here about. Think about that's a good one to think about though. That's a good good conversation topic. Uh, spitball that one around with your buddies and see what you come out with. Uh, yeah, this episode was awesome. Sitting down talking with Patrick Tecklenberg. Like I said, I I've talked to him here and there, and I've seen him at you know a couple jam nights, and I saw him at a couple shows. You know, uh, so it's I've seen him around, but I haven't really like sat down and really like one on one talked with him about some like you know quote unquote serious stuff. But uh, it was really fun to sit down and talk with him. You know, it's. Uh, He's, he's just such a fun guy, such a fun-loving guy, interesting guy, so it's uh, awesome to have him around. Go check him out if you are in the uh, eastern Iowa area. I know he plays around there, so check it out. I also am fairly certain he created a Facebook page. I'm going to find that link, and I'm going to put it in the description down below, because we talked about that in the podcast. So the, in, look in the description section. Show him some love. I think that should be something we do every week is just... Uh, you know, if, if you know the guest and you listen to the episode, go to the social medias and follow them on everything. And if you already do that, just uh, maybe go there and invite somebody to like it. I do know that has been a thing that uh, has worked in the past. And it sounds like trivial to do, you know, but uh, I don't know. Like you sit down with three or four guys and you're just like, hey, let's all just like invite somebody to like this, this person's page over there. And then before you know it, they got three or four hundred more likes. And you're like, oh. Well, there you go. That works. So help your buddies out. Go down there. Go, go down below. If you like Patrick, check out his stuff. Give him a click there and see what you got going on. Like his Facebook page. And uh, definitely, uh, if you already like it, you know, invite somebody else to like it. I don't know how many people would be listening to this. But, yeah, if you got Facebook, I mean, everybody has Facebook. Well, nowadays, you know, some people are actually starting to divert from it. But check it out. Patrick, he's a budding artist, and he's he's out there doing stuff. He likes to uh, play harmonica and sing and play the guitar. And, uh, you know, like I said, I got to play along with him for a couple songs. So easygoing guy, really fun-loving guy. So check him out at the next show nearest you. If you guys want to check out more Audible Farm stuff, go to audiblefarm.com. There's links to everything there. Uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Yes, we have a Twitter. Uh, there's a YouTube link there as well. You can subscribe to the YouTube there's also the latest episode will be on the website there, or you can just listen to it uh, wherever you're listening to it now. And wherever you're listening to it now, leave us a review, five stars, like, subscribe, share, poke, retweet, all that good stuff. Um, or, you know, four stars or one star. Let us know what you think. Just tell, tell us we need to do something else. There's also uh, the Audible Farm shop, shop.audiblefarm.com. will take you to the Audible Farm shop where you can buy t-shirts, and uh, there are still a few of those limited edition t-shirts left. And when those are gone, I don't know if I'll be getting those back. I'm, I'm still on the fence. I think I have an idea for a new design. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get that baby set up and get the ball rolling on that. I do have hoodies coming in uh, soon. I I'm made an order, and I'm just behind the other orders that were made before me. So I'm just waiting for mine to, to get you know shipped in and get made. And uh, when they're in... Trust me, you'll know. You'll know. It'll be on Facebook. It'll be everywhere. So follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all the social medias, YouTube. And uh, thanks for listening each and every week. Uh, it's really cool. I mean, episode 200 is next week. I'm not sure what I'm going to do. So I guess just tune in. Yeah, tune in. It's going to be fun. Episode 200 is next week. That's, uh, that's pretty wild, I guess, in the general sense. If you think about 200 episodes, that's about... It's about four years, which we're getting really close to the to the four-year anniversary. I don't know what the best way to measure this would be is, you know, I did I did do a bonus episode here or there where, where they were not during uh, the actual Thursdays that I released these, but I have actually had a couple weeks where I did replays and I had a couple weeks where I didn't post an episode because I was just too busy. So we'll see. I don't know. It's, uh, it's uh, about, about two years, though. It's pretty wild. 200 episodes coming up next week. I, uh, I've had a lot of people spit, you know, spin some ideas past me. I like some of the ideas. Um, I also just don't know. Some of them just seem like slightly impractical to pull off it, but it'd be tough. I, uh, I had this big dream of maybe getting a whole bunch of people together in the same room to talk about music stuff, but I, I wanted to invite people from different areas, and then it's the trouble is finding a day and finding the right people and people willing to drive etc etc and then i was like well i can have some people be remote and i was like bah, this is just too much so i don't know we'll see it's gonna be fun whatever we do for 200 it's gonna be fun even if it's just a regular episode uh you're still gonna you know just have to tune in to find out so check it out uh audible farm and all the social medias and all the everythings all right we'll see you next week peace